recording. Um, Dr. Kindler co-founded the New England Center for Holistic Medicine in Newberry, Mass, um, and has taught extensively, including practitioner training courses at the Omega Institute, the National Institute of Behavioral Medicine, and the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, and the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society. He created an, and organized the Lyme Fundamentals course, which is presented annually at the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society conferences. He is also author of many articles in medical journals and the Lyme Times, uh, which is a, a newsletter by LymeDisease.org. His integrated medical practice in Denver, Colorado focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of tick-borne illness. Dr. Kinderlehrer is also the author of Recovery from Lyme Disease, the Integrative Medicine Guide to the Diagnosis and Treatment of Tick-Borne Illnesses, which was released in March of 2021. And for those of you who have not read it, I know this is backwards on the screen, um, I highly recommend the book. It is, it is a fantastic reference for those um, new to Lyme or those that have been dealing with Lyme for years. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kinderlehrer. We so appreciate you being with, here with us again. Thank you. Really quick, one act, one last thing I just want to insert. Yes. During during the presentation, if you guys have any questions, please put them in chat. We will have a Q&A session at the end and Monica and I will be reading your questions. If you have any issues putting it in chat, you can text me at 720-280-2341. And I will put that number in, in chat so you do actually see that. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Monica and Jody, for all the work you do. You do, you know, in terms of bringing awareness to this problem. Um, so I appreciate being here, and I look forward to sharing some information today. Um, I am going to get a PowerPoint on the screen. I hope. I think. Let me. Whoops. There we go. And then I'm going to hit that. And there we are. OK. So what I want to talk about today is the fact that Lyme disease, in it particularly in its chronic manifestation, is not just a single infection with the yes. bug that causes Lyme disease, which is Borrelia burgdorferi. It's a big deal. There's a lot of things going on. And that's what I want to talk about today. It is not just the bugs. And therefore, I'd like to use the terminology of Lyme disease complex. I think that sort of subsumes the concept that it's a whole lot more than just Lyme disease. So we've been trained, and frankly, Western docs have been trained to look for one cause for one disease. This started with the germ theory. And it's just not true. It's an outdated paradigm. It does, does not, it does not explain chronic illness. Yes, it can explain acute illness. If, if a week ago you suddenly came down with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal cramps, you can logically conclude that this was due to one infection, perhaps Giardia or something like that. But once you're months and months into an illness, there are more things going on. So I'd like to talk about what else is going on in people with Lyme disease complex. So first of all, and this is very important, virtually all chronic Lyme patients have co-infections. So Monica has informed me that, that the people attending this lecture, this whatever we're doing right now, that, that you come from a whole lot of different experiences. Some of you are newcomers to Lyme disease. I'm sorry that you've joined our club or have needed to join our club, but, um, and some of you have been around for a long time. And so I'll do my best to elaborate and I'm sure I'm gonna be repeating things to a lot of you, but that's how we learn. Okay, so the ticks carry a whole lot more than just this one bug, Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme. It has other bugs and we call them co-infections. Joe Burescano, who is now retired, but has really been an outstanding Lyme practitioner, he described ticks as nature's dirty needle. And, and that's what happens. You know, you get a tick attachment and it can transmit a handful of bugs. One, when, when people get acute Lyme disease and they only have 
Lyme. That is, they only have an infection with Borrelia burgdorferi and they're otherwise health, healthy. A relatively short course of antibiotics usually does cure it. And that's maybe the one place I can agree with the CDC. Uh, on the other hand, once you add co-infections, it, it changes the scenario totally. One short course, and when I, when I say short course, I mean even three or four weeks of antibiotics is not gonna cure someone with co-infections. I can say my average patient has Lyme disease plus two co-infections. I've had patients with five co-infections. Uh, you know, these, and maybe they got them from more than one tick attachment, maybe not. Okay, so now we're talking about multiple infections, much harder to treat. And, and then when people develop these infections, they develop uh, downstream issues. So first I wanna just talk about the fact that these bugs don't cause illness the way we normally think of infection. We normally think say of a, a strep throat or a wound infection as some local invasion of tissues uh, some cellular disruption, and then there's a local inflammatory response to try to kill the bugs and repair the tissue. That's what we see with, with, with acute infections, but that's not what these do. They don't attack the hardware of our cells. They attack the software of our regulatory systems. And you see here, downstream issues include endocrine and immune disruption and nervous system disruption. These are regulatory systems in our body and our bodies go haywire in a number of ways and we'll talk about that. Okay, upstream issues. So these are issues that preceded getting a tick bite and they, they need to be considered in the, in the evaluation of patients. For example, do people have genetic issues with methylation? We'll talk about what that is. Had they suffered really significant childhood trauma because that's going to affect their immune capacity? Have they had previous allergies and mold exposure and so on? These are issues that if we want to treat chronic illness, they have to be addressed. And one of the points I want to make is that I really work on building infrastructure, these other downstream issues and stabilizing people before aggressively treating the antibiotics. Okay, so here's a summary of what I would put under the heading of Lyme disease complex. We got Lyme disease, we have co-infections, then we get disruption of our hormones. We get disruption of our immune dysfunction and this results in sensitivity issues, that is uh, hyperinflammation and reactivity, but it also results in, in uh, suppression of normal immune function and therefore our resistance to infections and our ability to clear infections. Nervous system dysregulation, this may be the worst, the worst aspect of Lyme disease complex. I'm gonna be talking about each one of these, gastrointestinal issues, viral activation, detoxification issues. Okay, here are Lyme co-infections. This is just, I think there's some general acknowledgement about that. So. Um, Monica was kind enough to just tout my book. Thank you, Monica. There is a chapter in there called The Other Borrelias. Okay, so the other Borrelias include tick-borne relapsing fever, which is weird. Tick-borne relapsing fever is this uh, syndrome in which people get sudden spikes of their temperature, to, even to like 106 degrees, and then sudden defervescence, and their temperature goes down to normal, huge number of symptoms associated with that, and then they go five or six days without any symptoms at all. That's tick-borne relapsing fever. And the, the Borrelia that do that, like these two I mentioned, Hermsey and, and Miyamotai, um, it turns out they don't only do that, they, but instead they just cause Lyme disease. They, they cause the same syndrome we see with Borrelia burgdorferi. And um, I think perhaps with the exception that they don't generally cause the erythema, uh, no, the, the rash, the bullseye rash associated with Lyme disease. STARI stands for um, Southern Tick-Borne Associated Rash Illness. There's a great story behind this. And I, again, I described it in the book, but basically 
this is a Lyme-like illness, but it's not transmitted by the black-legged or deer tick. It's transmitted by the lone star tick. So the CDC doesn't recognize it as causing Lyme disease. Another story. Okay, Ehrlichia chaffensis, anaplasma phagocytophyllum. Uh, this is, these are other bugs that, uh, that the black-legged, understand black-legged is the preferred terminology to deer ticks, but I'm gonna use the word deer ticks because most people will recognize that. Actually, it's anaplasma that mainly are in deer ticks. Ehrlichia is more in the lone star tick. Babesia, a big one. Um, there's three, well, Microdian duncani are the main ones in the United States, divergence mainly in Europe. Uh, can cause severe illness. I'm really not gonna be talking about these infections much. I'm gonna be talking about what, what else is going on, but you should be acquainted with what they are because I'm telling you that all of my chronic patients have one, two, three, four of these, and, and you gotta address them. Uh, Bartonella, which causes severe inflammation. So does mycoplasma, and we're talking about neuroinflammation. I mean, people going nuts. Rickettsia, the spotted fever group. Rickettsia also is Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which by the way, is very rare in the Rocky Mountains. And it's mainly on the East Coast and the Southeast in particular. And you're probably wondering why it's called Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And that's because the first case was in Utah. But uh, that, does, that is really in dog ticks and wood ticks. We, I'm not worried about that at all, but there is uh, a, a relative, cousins of that, that do occur in the deer ticks. They're called the spotted fever group. We see this occasionally. There's tularemia, brucella, and then there's viruses. Okay, so this is not in any particular sequence. I'm just gonna go through the things that I typically find and need to address in my patients with Lyme disease complex. And I need to address these, not just to help people feel better. I need to address these so that their bodies can better fight the infection. And I should point this out that for our bodies to clear infections, we need more than antibiotics. We need an attack, intact immune system. You know, remember the, the really poor sufferers who had AIDS. It didn't matter if we threw gallons of antibiotics at them. Once their immune system was kaput, sadly, they were kaput. Uh, so we really need to do everything we can, we can to get the bodies into balance and to support immune system in particular. But we're going to start with hormones. Okay, the adrenal glands. Adrenal glands are small glands. They sit on top of the kidneys. They're sort of the size and shape of walnuts. They put out this whole symphony of different hormones. Uh, the ones most people are aware of are adrenaline, which is epinephrine and noradrenaline, norepinephrine. And these come out under acute stress. So acute stress, like you're in a car accident, suddenly like, whoa, and you know something terrible just happened. And that's the so-called fight or flight reaction. Although I should mention that to some extent, the, there's a gender, difference that, that women, who frankly seem to be more involved, evolved than, than the males, um, that, that they often go to tend and befriend. That's a whole other discussion, but really fascinating. Well, at the same time your body puts out these hormones of adrenaline, they also put out DHEA and cortisol. And but if you're under chronic st stress, they continue to put out DHEA and cortisol. And that, that helps our, the cells in our body deal with the extra demands of being under stress. And when I say under stress, I mean any kind of stress. It could be emotional stress, but it could be a chronic infection, or it could be chronic pain, or it could be chronic anxiety. And so we're putting out more all the time of cortisol, and DHEA, but then the adrenals can lose their reserve. And now instead of putting out more, they're putting out less. And I would say mm, maybe up to half of my patients that I see, remember the people I see mostly have been sick for years or decades, at least half I think have some low adrenal function. And this low adrenal function will result in fatigue and decreased immune function and other issues as well, low blood pressure. And so what I do is I measure cortisols and DHEA in all my patients, 
And I'm not gonna be talking about treatment very much during this lecture. I'm happy to answer questions to the best I can, but the types of remedies that we use are low dose hydrocortisone, DHEA supplementation, adrenal glandulars, and different herbs like I've listed here. I want to point out low dose hydrocortisone is a totally different animal from high dose cortisone. If even if you have something as sort of benign as poison ivy, you will get a medrol dose pack, which has maybe a hundred times the amount of cortisone as the low dose cortisone. High dose cortisone, which we use for lupus and we use for asthma and we use for um, a handful of, of other conditions will suppress inflammation, but it will also suppress the immune system and it will suppress the adrenals. Low dose hydrocortisone actually will support the immune system and support the adrenal glands. Okay, moving on. I wanna talk about the thyroid. So the thyroid gland, you know, it sits on the neck and, <clears throat> and you know, we know it particularly because um, if you're too low, it causes fatigue. And if it's too high, it's as if you are over caffeinated and you get sweaty and anxious and can't sleep. Okay. And a lot of doctors will just do a TSH level as a screening. The TSH, and I'll show you because I, I have a diagram coming up. Uh, the, the TSH is actually a pituitary hormone that responds to thyroid levels, which are the T4 and T3. <clears throat> so I want to point out that while most labs say that TSH is normal up to 4.5, most of us don't buy it. And again, my book has, has uh, studies that describe that not everyone buys it. I would, in, I would say clinically, any TSH greater than two is suspicious. But remember, we don't treat the number, we treat the patient. So it, it really depends on how someone clinically presents. But if they're presenting with fatigue and cold intolerance and they can't sweat and things like that, I'm going to suspect that they have a low thyroid if even if the TSH is, say, 2.5 or 3. And I want to point out that you know, I'm going to go to the next. I just want to show this, and then this will make more sense. So the hypothalamus can be considered a central switchboard for hormones. And it secretes about, I don't know, a, a dozen. I, I'm not sure. I don't recall. A, a bunch of hormones or pre-hormones. One of them is TRH, or thyroid-releasing hormone. It tells the pituitary gland to release TSH, which is thyroid-stimulating hormone. That in turn tells the thyroid to produce T4 and T3. Now, this is interesting. It's something I never learned in med medical school or internal medicine training. The thyroid gland makes mainly T4 and less T3, but it's T3 that does most of the work. T3 is less bound up with protein and it's more available to the tissues. And T3 binds with receptors on the cells and gives a message and the message is, increase the rate of metabolism or, you know, make more energy. Okay. Well, what happens once the, these thyroid hormones are out of the thyroid gland is T4 is converted to T3. All they do, all that happens is there's an enzyme deiodinase that strips away one of the iodine and therefore, thereby T4 becomes T3. T3 attaches to receptors on the cell membrane and then there's a signal to increase energy production. However, T4 can also be converted to reverse T3. And I sometimes refer to reverse T3 as T3's evil twin brother, but more technically, it's a competitive inhibitor. It binds with those very same receptors as T3, but blocks the action. Now, normally, maybe 20% of T4 is converted to reverse T3. But under different circumstances, particularly inflammation, more T4 gets converted to reverse T3, like up to 50%. And then the ratio of T3 to reverse T3 goes down, and you have a blocking of, of thyroid action at the cell surface. And people at that point become functionally hypothyroid, even though their thyroid gland may be working absolutely correctly. So, uh, so when I do thyroid function tests, 
I always do a reverse T3 as well, and then compute the ratio of T3 to reverse T3. And if it's less than seven, I'm going to be suspicious that maybe there's too much conversion to reverse T3 and, and then give people T3. I just want to mention that endocrinologists usually only treat with T4. And there are a handful of studies that have shown people do much better if you give them T3 as well. And I am generalizing. There are people who don't tolerate one or the other. So I want to just go back here. Thyroid replacement should include T3 with T4. This can be done with synthetic replacement, which are levothyroxine and lyothyronine. And then um, there are so-called natural thyroid supplements. They actually come from porcine or pig thyroid. Armor thyroid is readily available still. NP thyroid, um, some doses, doses have been taken off the market as you know, not having what they should have inside them. Nature thyroid, which really worked well for people, that's been taken off the market again because it didn't have in it what was advertised. You can get these things compounded at your compounding pharmacy. And then I go into a description of the low ratio of T3 to reverse T3 that we already talked about, which I treat with selenium and, and more T3, which is lyothyronine. Uh, that's what the prescription T3 is. Okay, I hope I haven't lost anyone yet. Um, let's talk about the pituitary gland. So, you know, just go back here and see uh, the pituitary it sits at the base of the brain. The hypothalamus is in the center of the brain, but near the floor. Pituitary is right under it. And then these hormones and prehormones go down the pituitary stalk to the pituitary gland, which secretes about nine different hormones. I think I'm amazed by the pituitary gland. It's maybe like the size of a pea and puts out nine different hormones, each under its separate stimulation and inhibitory control. I think that's amazing, but of course I haven't dealt with computer chips. Okay, so what if pituitary dysfunction is low? Well, one of the hormones that comes out of, of the pituitary gland is antidiuretic hormone. And what that does is normally is ADH messages the kidneys and says, this person's a little dehydrated concentrate the urine so we can hold on to more fluid and not pee out as much. So if you have adequate antidiuretic hormone and get dehydrated, you're going to have uh, more yellow urine, more smelly urine. And if you lack antidiuretic hormone, you're going to be peeing out what looks like water. So lack of antidiuretic hormone, follow me, that's a, that's a a double negative, right? Lack of antidiuretic hormone is as if you're taking a diuretic. You're going to be peeing all the time. And then you're going to be thirsty because you're dehydrated. And what happens when I ask people, do you pee a lot? If they have this condition of low antidiuretic hormone, they usually say, well, yeah, but I drink a lot. But it's actually the other way around. They drinking a lot because they're peeing a lot and their, their body is sensing that they're dehydrated but they can't catch up. You're always going to keep on peeing every time you drink. So you know, I can tell you in internal medicine training, I was taught that this condition, which is known as diabetes insipidus, not to be confused with blood sugar problems, which is diabetes mellitus, uh, diabetes, I'm told in Latin or Greek, on one of those languages remote to me, um, means that you pee a lot, okay? And, uh, but it has nothing in common with blood sugar issues. It's just that you pee a lot. And um, so I've been told it's a fairly esoteric illness. We don't see it maybe as a neurosurgical uh, complication. It's not, it's not rare. And we see it particularly with toxin related illness and like mold toxins, which I'm gonna be talking about. In fact, I just had a patient you like this one. She this is a 60 year old woman. She came back from Virginia with a tick attachment, a rash, and started to have symptoms. And she contact. She was referred to me, and you know I saw her within a month. Took a history, and when I took the history, it turned out she's had anxiety complaints since adolescence. And she remembered, you know, 
you know, back when she was 12 or 13, she remembers having some sort of insect bite. That's all she remembered about it. And then she remembered getting these red lines on her thighs and abdomen, which sort of look like stretch marks, but are really Bartonella stria. I don't think I'm gonna be talking a whole lot about it other than to say, if you, if you don't know about Bartonella stria, you should at least Google pictures of Bartonella stria because there, there's all sorts of um, confusion about it. People think they're stretch marks and they're not. They can look like it. They're actually a different level of dermis. My point is that this woman who had anxiety issues since adolescence actually had Bartonella since adolescence. And she was also diagnosed with interstitial cystitis. Why? Because she had a pee all the time. And I said, gee, I think you have diabetes insipidus. And we, <laughs> and we tested her and she does. She has low antidiuretic hormone. And when I treated her for that, suddenly she doesn't have to pee all the time. That is what she was most grateful for. She said that has changed her life. Okay, moving right along. Under pituitary dysfunction, women can have low estrogen and progesterone. And, and this is obviously um, going to cause disruption of the normal menstrual cycle. Low testosterone. I mentioned low testosterone in males because that's pituitary regulated. Um, but I will get to low testosterone in females, just not pituitary related. Low growth hormone, which can affect energy in particular. And low TSH. Now I'm going to go back and you know remind you that this T4 and T3 they they feed back to the pituitary gland. They say, okay, there's enough of this. You don't have to you know secrete more TSH. Again, if there's not enough, the TSH rises. Okay, it's going to go inversely to the T4 and the T3. Well, what happens if the T4 and the T3 are on the low side, but so is the TSH? Well, sadly. Even endocrinologists, which is very dismaying to me, say, oh, well, the TSH is too low. Too low. You must be replacing with too much T4 and T3. No, the T4 and T3 are on the low side. The problem is the pituitary gland is not making TSH. You can't use the TSH anymore as an indicator of thyroid status. I emphasizing this only because I see this misdiagnosed all the time, even by endocrinologists who should know better. Okay, logonadal function. So uh, this inclu includes low estrogen and progesterone in women, um, but, also, but low testosterone in both women and men. Um, so in women, testosterone comes from the adrenals and from the ovaries. And it's not uncommon that I see premenopausal women with low, who have Lyme disease complex, who have low testosterone levels. And this affects energy and well being as well as libido. Okay, insulin resistance. This has been getting more attention by mainstream doctors for quite a while, as it should. So um, in my book, I talk about what happened in the 1960s when the Harvard School of Public Health decided to tell everyone to eat tons of carbohydrates and less fat. And since then, we've had an epidemic of obesity and diabetes. And I won't talk about, well, I guess I am talking about how basically they were bought off by the, by the uh, food industry. At any rate, um, here's what happens. I'm going to go to the next slide and I'll come back. Okay. So when you eat, can I do this? Yeah. When you eat anything with sugar or carbs, the blood sugar goes up. That's normal. And then that triggers a response from your pancreas to release insulin. And then what insulin does is it comes knocking at the doors of the cells. It attaches to certain receptors and it gives a message. And the message is open the door, take the sugar out of the bloodstream into the cell where it can be metabolized and the blood sugar comes down. And this is a normal blood sugar insulin response. However, what happens if the insulin comes knocking on the door and the door doesn't open? Well, then the pancreas is going to secrete more insulin and it keeps on secreting more and more insulin until those doors open up. So at that stage, you have there we go, insulin resistance. So 
The insulin attaches to specific receptors on cell membranes. It gives the message to open up the doors, allow the blood sugar in the cell. Um, and, but if there is insulin resistance, the cells do not respond appropriately to this insulin message. And in return, the pancreas cranks up more insulin. And what happens? Well, then you have high insulin levels. High insulin is not good for you. It can cause inflammation. It can cause obesity, of which we now have an epidemic. Uh, it can cause fatigue. Some of these people who get sleepy after a meal, in many of them, it's insulin resistance and high insulin levels. And I want to mention, that's a, this is a pre-diabetic condition. I think I'm going to come back to that. Yep. Increased risk of cardiovascular disease, decreased resistance to infection with high insulin levels. And this eventually, if not treated, or if it continues at a high level, this can lead to adult onset diabetes, which is another epidemic in the United States. You know, when I was in training, which I hate to admit, but it was back in the 70s, when I was in training, I never saw someone less than 40 years old who had adult onset diabetes, and they were typically morbidly obese. Now, kids are being diagnosed with adult onset diabetes. Crazy, right? Um, Okay, how do we treat it? Well, first of all, with the low glycemic diet, which basically takes out starches. Uh, there are certain supplements which can uh, improve insulin sensitivity like chromium, alpha lipoic acid, and gymnema sylvestra. Metformin is usually the drug of choice, but this is important even if you don't have Lyme disease and you don't want the excess inflammation associated with insulin, resistance, this is important for your overall health, well-being, and longevity. Okay, nervous system dysregulation. As I mentioned at the outset, the worst, the worst symptoms associated with Lyme disease are, is not what might be awful pain in the, in the joints and in the muscles. It's the nervous system. So I'm going to talk about a few different things. Dysautonomia. So this is, a, this is abnormalities in the autonomic nervous system. You can think of the autonomic nervous system as the automatic nervous system. You don't have to think of when to breathe, how hard and how fast your heart should be, where your blood should flow, et cetera. All of this is done on an unconscious level. It's regulated by the autonomic nervous system, which, um, which has at its head the hypothalamus, Hypothalamus is, has a lot of uh, a lot of responsibilities, and then um, and then comes down the spinal cord and in the sympathetic chain and so on. And so there's two arms of the autonomic nervous system, and it gets more complex than this for people who are interested in the polyvagal theory, which I'm I'm not going to be getting in today. But 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 the autonomic nervous system in its more simple form has two arms: the sympathetic arm mostly is activating and the parasympathetic arm, which is mostly has a break. So this, you know, having an accelerator and a break can help keep you in homeostasis. That's what the autonomic nervous is supposed to do. However, if there's inflammation in the body, this can cause chaos in the autonomic nervous system. The most common symptoms associated with this are in the category of blood pressure and pulse. So POTS, uh, POTS is an acronym for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is just what it sounds like. Postural meaning when you stand up, orthostatic meaning related to position, tachycardia, heart racing syndrome. So people stand up, their pulse goes from 70, 100, 120, I have patients whose pulses go up to 150 and they feel all these palpitations. And even though their blood pressure may be stable, they often get lightheaded and can even pass out. NMH stands for neurally mediated hypotension. So in this case, uh, the pulse can remain fairly stable, but the blood pressure drops. So the blood pressure might be 120 over 80 and then the people stand up and suddenly it's like 80 over 45 and they, again, get very lightheaded, and in some cases actually pass out. Well, uh, there are a whole lot of symptoms associated with dysautonomia besides 
the palpitations. And by the way, it's not only it's not only heart racing, but it can also be heart pounding. I remember when I was sick, I could be I could lie in bed at night, and my I, it would be like a hammer on my chest, and so much so that if you were watching me lying down, my body would actually move a little bit with each bit with each beat. That's how hard my heart was beating. I am not alone. My patients sometimes describe this as well. Other symptoms associated with dysautonomia, shortness of breath, anxiety, flushing, modeling, mast cells, degranulating. I'm gonna come back to that. Gastrointestinal symptoms, bloating, constipation, nausea, vomiting, reflux. Neurogenic bladder, this is like, could be either you can't control it and you're incontinent or you can't empty at all. Um, excessive sweating or lack of sweating, heat and cold intolerance, um, and erectile dysfunction. I'll just mention that the worst dysautonomic symptoms that I see are in patients with Babesia. If someone presents primarily with severe dysautonomia, I'm going to think Babesia right away and look for that. Okay, more nervous system problems, neuroinflammation, just imagine if you had a lot of inflammation in your brain, as in brain on fire, this can cause all sorts of neuropsych symptoms, depression, anxiety, irritability. These are so common and they can be the predominant presentation of patients with Lyme disease complex. And sadly, these people get referred to a psychiatrist who treats them as having a primary psychiatric issue instead of an organic problem resulting in neuropsychiatric symptoms. I'm not dismissing that people should go to a, a psychiatrist, but hopefully one who knows something about these infections and knows what to do about it. And I will say there is increasing interest on the part of psychiatrists. Earlier this year, I gave a lecture to about 200 psych psychiatrists who, you know, when it was on uh, microbes causing mental illness. Okay, something that I'm seeing more and more of, I think this is a increasingly not silent epidemic is PANS, Pediatric Acute Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. So back in the 1990s, Susan Swedo at the National Institute for Mental Health described kids who, who were fine, they were absolutely normal kids, then they had a strep throat and they fell off a cliff. Suddenly they have severe OCD, they, they have anxiety and depression and or angry outbreaks and they start falling behind in school and, and so on. It turns out it's not only strep that can do this, but certain tick-borne infections can do it and some viruses can do it and probably mold can do this. And, uh, and, and now it, this is referred to as pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome. I think that the nomenclature is really off. For one thing, it's not just the pediatric population. This happens to adults. And it's not just acute, which means sudden or recent. It can be sort of a stuttering or slowly building kind of presentation. This can result in psychosis. I have a patient now, this poor young woman, she's about 15, I think. You know, she actually has hallucinations on a daily basis. And most of the time she can simply say, okay, that's a hallucination. And then occasionally they overwhelm her. They become her reality. And her mom has shared videos with me where this poor child is, is lying on the floor, crumpled into a fetal position, screaming because these, whatever she's perceiving are attacking her. I, I mean, this is really awful stuff, but this is brain on fire. Uh, many, many of my patients will describe brain fog or impaired cognition, loss of short-term memory, um, inability to focus, sort of adult attention deficit disorder problems, uh, loss of executive function, function, which refers to ability to organize and plan. Um, you know, this is interesting. I have a what's considered a pretty good memory, and I particularly have a good memory for numbers. And when when uh, I was bad, when I was really had a lot of, of issues with brain fog, and back then <laughs> we only had voicemail. We didn't have cell phones. Um, 
I would try to take a message off, off my, the voicemail and I couldn't keep two numbers in my head to write it down. I would have to go back seven times to write down a phone number, really. Okay, peripheral nervous system. We're talking about neuropathy. We're talking about nerves and, uh, and they can cause sensory or motor dysfunction. Sensory is, is pain. The pain typically is not an aching pain. It's more burning, stinging, sharp, shooting electric kind of pain or since pins and needles sensation, like if your uh, arm fall or leg falls asleep because you're in a funny yoga position numbness or creepy crawlies. It you know, feels like insects are, are crawling on you. Um, or motor issues, meaning you know the nerves aren't working well and you, you're weak and sometimes even paralysis. I want to mention that Bartonella and Babesia causes the worst in terms of neuroinflammatory symptoms. If I'm seeing much to my neuroinflammation, I'm immediately going to look to see if a patient has one or both of those bugs. And probably most of my patients have both in addition to Lyme. Gastrointestinal issues, okay, moving right along. There are so many things that can, that can get out of balance here. Hypochlorhydria is low stomach acid. You know, I wish I could ask the, the group here, like how many have, you ever, have ever heard of low stomach acid? Because what do we hear? We hear about GERD and all the things that can decrease stomach acid. It turns out, low stomach acid is a big issue. And it gets worse as we get older. It get, it's worse with autoimmune problems it, and worse with these chronic inflammatory issues. So stomach acid is really important. It's there for a reason, although you wouldn't get the gastroenterologist to recognize that since it seems like they prescribe a huge number of protein pump inhibitors, which are in fact decrease stomach acid production. So stomach acid is necessary for absorption, really chelation, then absorption of minerals. If you don't have enough stomach acid, you're gonna be really prone to osteoporosis and all sorts of other issues associated with, with low mineral absorption, okay? Uh, it's necessary to start to break down proteins into their individual amino acids so that you can absorb them. It's also important as boundary function. It kills bugs before they get into your intestines. So low stomach acid is actually a risk factor for overgrowth of bacteria in your gut or, and problems with parasites and things like that. Low stomach acid classically, which means not in everybody, but <laughs> will cause bloating, gas, constipation, sometimes belching, and a condition called early satiety, which is, a which is a fancy way of saying people fill up kind of quickly when they start to eat, and it takes a while for their food to go down. And some people will describe that, say, oh yeah, you know, I, I start to eat, I'm full, and then gradually it goes down and I'll eat some more. Okay, and you can replace this with stomach acid pills, betaine hydrochloride, but this needs to be done but I describe in the book how to do it. Um, you don't just start taking the pills. There's a methodology to this. Um, okay, pancreatic insufficiency. Basically, the pancreas isn't producing enough digestive enzymes. The most common symptoms are um, diarrhea and gas or seeing uh, undigested food in the stool. And that can happen also with hypochlorhydria. Or you can, all these Supplements we take are coming out in the stool and you know obviously not being assimilated. That's a sign that you know you either have hypochlorhydria or pancreatic insufficiency or both. This has you know a, a simple fix, which is you take enzymes at the end of a meal. Bile acid insufficiency. Bile is uh, comes out of the liver, is concentrated in the gallbladder, and is necessary for fat absorption. So when there's fat malabsorption, fatty food issues and typically causes diarrhea and so on, um, you, can, you can also supplement with ox bile. Okay, food intolerances. Something I haven't gotten to yet is that we see a lot of sensitivity issues in people with Lyme disease complex. 
and that includes sensitivities to foods. Excuse me, these are the most common foods that I see people have sensitivity to, eggs, dairy, yeast, and gluten. I should write sugar in there as well. Sugar and yeast sort of go together. And, um, you know, I'll just mention, um, uh, I think it was two to three weeks ago, I had another article posted on LymeDisease.org and it was a kid with PANS. And the first thing we did, we, we took them off dairy, sugar, and yeast, and we gave them nystatin, which kills yeast in the intestines. He did a 180. I mean, he was dramatically better just from doing that. Okay, but I should point out, you could be sensitive to a whole lot more than simply these four. Okay, dysbiosis, a fancy, very general designation for uh, imbalance of microbes in the gut. So one that we see a lot and we have to be particularly careful for when people are on antibiotics is overgrowth of yeast and that's referred to candidiasis. And then people can be sensitive, become sensitized to that yeast and there you go, that's there. then you have sugar and yeast problems. But we also see other kinds of fungal overgrowth in the gut. SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So the large colon, the large intestine, which is the colon, is teeming with trillions of bacteria, but the small intestine has only a relative, relatively scarce amount of bacteria, but under certain conditions, including constipation, including low stomach acid, the bacteria in the small intestine can overgrow. And then typically you can get problems with diarrhea and or constipation, but more a lot of um, abdominal uh, distension, that is bloating, uh, gas, often nausea and abdominal pain. And there are agents needed to treat this, but you also have to treat the underlying problem, i.e. why did people get SIBO? I'm really struck by how many people have parasites and worms. You know, Dietrich Klinghart, um, he, he's been saying for a long time that everybody is Everybody with Lyme is parasites. He also says everybody is Lyme, but, but um, I'm actually beginning to agree with him. I think that, that it's not uncommon. I, I had a large segment of the American population as parasites, but they don't cause a problem if you are otherwise well balanced. And then when our immune systems get out of balance by things like Lyme disease, suddenly these parasites are causing a lot of inflammation. And I don't mean just gut inflammation, I mean joint pains and brain fog and fatigue. So I had a patient, she had Lyme and, and Babesia, we were treating her and she's about 80%. And then she comes in uh, for a standard appointment. She describes to me that she was online and she was part of a group where people discussed um, using mimosa pudica seed which is important to distinguish from most of Pudica from the leaves and the stems to treat worms. And she didn't, wasn't aware of a problem there. She did have gastrointestinal symptoms, but they were mostly better when she went off gluten. At any rate, she took this mimosa Pudica seed and lo and behold, she found there were worms coming out of her stool. And by the way, this is an ICU nurse. And, uh, and she also saw tapeworm coming out and she said after she did after she did this after she took this mimosa pudica seed she felt a hundred percent i mean it was an amazing shift and after that i started recommending the mimosa pudica seed to patients who had ongoing inflammation even though we thought we had treated everything and at least 50 percent say oh my god i can't believe what came out of me some really disturbing wiggly things Okay, gastroparesis. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, actually a psychiatrist, um, she coined the term Bell's palsy of the gut. And, um, and basically, it, and this is only people with Lyme, this is a known condition, but the gut's paralyzed, it just doesn't move. And uh, it, it, basically people are somewhere from very constipated to obstipated, meaning it's just not moving at all. And this can be associated with some of the in, these tick-borne infections, uh, which cause a neuropathy of the gut. And it's a real, real problem. 
leaky gut syndrome. You know, the gut has this uh, sort of paradoxical function of uh, wanting to assimilate certain nutrients, but keeping certain things out. And if, if that function is not working properly, both of them go awry. So you're no longer absorbing nutrients you should, and your body is letting in macromolecules that it shouldn't let in, and that's causing inflammation, more stress on the liver, and so on. Uh, we can measure that. And all of these conditions, you know, maldigestion, food intolerances, dysbiosis, gastroparesis, all can result in leaky gut syndrome. So when people have leaky gut syndrome, we have to ask why and treat always be treating the underlying conditions. Immune dysfunction, you know, I'm, I'm separating things out like immune system, endocrine or hormone and nervous system. They, these are not separate systems at all. We do this in particularly Western ways, you know, to try to understand things. Um, but it's really all one huge communication network but we're separating them out just to try to understand what they, what's going on on a functional level. So and with immune dysfunction, we're talking about the ability of our body to distinguish what's, what's us and what's not us, and then what's a threat and what's not a threat. And then, and then if it is a threat to efficiently and successfully eliminate it and not deal with things that aren't a threat, just say, hey, not a problem. This wheat molecule, this dust or pollen, I'm just going to ignore it. That's a well-balanced immune system. But <clears throat> in all of the inflammation we see with these infections, remember that these infections hit the regulatory system. We're systems. We're talking about immune, hormonal, and nervous fu system function. We see a lot of sensitization. People become se sensitive to foods. Mo I would say at least half of my patients have food sensitivities, probably more, and gluten is right up there. And most of them did not have food sensitivities before getting Lyme. Some of them did, and if they did before, then they're worse. Okay, and again, I've said this before, the most common foods are dairy, eggs, yeast, gluten, put sugar in there as well. Okay, people become sensitive to inhalants. So we're talking about pollens and dust, and mold. You know, we live here in Colorado, it's dry. The CDC claims it's too dry to have deer ticks. That's mashuga, as my grandmother would say, it's crazy. That's, that's just crazy. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's not too dry that <laughs> here in my backyard, we are now getting mosquitoes. And it's not too dry that we can go hunting for mushrooms, you know, and it's not too dry that we don't have indoor water damage that then fosters mold growth. I'm gonna come back and talk about mold, but it's very common for people to, with Lyme to become sensitized to mold that before they are living with without a problem. And, you know, I'll just point out, I have patients with Lyme who are really messed up by living in, in a house that's moldy, but the other inhabitants of the house are, are not having a problem with it. Uh, it's, there's no question in my mind that it's part of this sensitization that occurs when we're already in a hyper-inflammatory state. It's not uncommon for people with Lyme disease complex to develop sensitivity to chemicals known as MCS for multiple chem chemical sensitivity syndrome. And now, you know, the people are reacting to low doses of chemicals ambient in our environment, in our environment such as perfume, such as, you know, laundry detergents and, and colognes and, and all sorts of hairsprays and those terrible bounce things that they put in dryers. My wife can't go out when, when people are, have stuff in their dryers with those dryer sheets. I think that's one of the worst. But e exhaust fumes, I mean, I mean, people with severe MCS can't go in public places. They can't go in lots of stores, either. They, or they know that they can't go down the, the laundry detergent aisle, you know, because of the smells. And we're seeing more and more people who have sensitivity to electromagnetic fields. Whoa, you know, I don't know what we're going to do about this because our exposure to EMFs has already 
escalated hugely and it's going to be escalating even more with 5G becoming more and more widespread. Um, this is well documented and you know I think in another generation it is going to be well accepted that there is such a thing as EMF sensitivity and EMF toxicity. Uh, right now it's still considered fringe. But I'll point out MCS was considered fringe a decade ago. And now, you know, my, uh, my neighbor is like, he's some executive in the Colorado allergy and asthma. They're huge. They have like 12 buildings. It's like amazing to me how big this practice is. He said, he said there, there is a sign in every door, on the front door of every building, don't come in if you're wearing a scent. You know, um, I urge all of you, if you do wear scents, don't do it. It's not good for a lot of people around you. You get on to an elevator with someone who has MCS, they will have a bad day, I guarantee it. And, and, and even though many people like the scents, find it attractive, some of us don't. So it's just, you know, a plea to those out here who, who still enjoy wearing perfumes. Autoimmunity, this is our body attacking ourselves. I talked about PANS, uh, Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, in which a, a microbial infection then triggers an immune response, which attacks the brain. Well, a lot of the inflammation we see in with Lyme disease complex is really an autoimmune reaction, which is, by the way, this is what we're seeing in long COVID syndrome. We're going to see more and more problems because of COVID. Okay, mast cell activation syndrome. I promised I would come back to this. So mast cells are primitive white cells, early progenitor white, white blood cells. And they're initially at different orifices to protect us against invaders. They have somehow evolved. They, they actually contain almost 200 uh, agents, molecules that regulate immune system function, most of which cause inflammation. So they're all sitting inside this cell. And when the cell gets triggered, the mast cells degranulate, they release these, and then there's inflammation, which can take the, uh, many different forms. The best known agent that comes out of mast cells is histamine. So typical allergic reactions involve mast cell degranulation. Anaphylaxis it involves mast cell degranulation, but it may not be obvious, that is, the inflammation may not be an obvious allergic reaction. The inflammation might cause brain fog or headaches or maybe some problems breathing or pain syndromes. And, uh, and it, it can cause neuroinflammation with, with neuropsychiatric symptoms. We know that these bugs can trigger mast cell activation. We know that you know the foods and and uh, mold and things like that can trigger it. But it seems that once people develop Lyme disease complex and are in a state of chronic inflammation, these mast cells take on a life of their own. And you, we have to not only treat the the trigger, but treat the mast cells themselves. And there are agents we can give that help stabilize the mast cells. And we also give antihistamines and, and other agents to try to protect people from this inflammation. Okay, and then not only do our immune systems overreact, but they can underreact and that's immune suppression. We're no longer fighting off infections well. And that includes issues with viruses, which I'm gonna be talking about, decreased capacity to clear infections in general, which includes tick-borne infections. So here's viral activation. A virus infection, interestingly, can activate an otherwise dormant tick-borne infection. So this is important. If you get bitten by a tick and get a transmission of, of Borrelia burgdorferi and maybe uh, a co-infection or two, some people with really intact immune systems can actually keep those bugs at bay and you not be symptomatic, which is good for you. That's really great. But then under certain conditions, those otherwise dormant bugs can be activated. One of the things that can activate it, one out of a list really, are virus infections. 
And so I've seen people who, by history, they probably got uh, one they were visiting Cape Cod, they seem to have gotten uh, Lyme disease at that point, but all they got was a rash and nothing else happened. And then a few years later, they got infectious mononucleosis, which is Epstein-Barr virus. And then all their symptoms came out that are we now recognize as Lyme disease complex. And then the inverse, no, the converse happens, okay? Tick-borne infections can activate otherwise dormant viral infections. So most of us have things like Epstein-Barr virus. Most of us have been exposed to this virus, and yes, it causes infectious mononucleosis, and men, maybe most of us don't recall ever having mono, but most of us have been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus. If you test everyone on the block, almost everyone will have some antibodies, but that otherwise dormant virus can get activated, and now you're dealing not just with these bacterial infections from the tick, but now you're dealing with uh, an added viral infection. And these added viral infections can increase inflammation. They flare other the symptoms you already have, particularly fatigue, and then they just add to making treatment more difficult. And here are the more common viruses we see. Epstein-Barr virus, as I mentioned, cytomegalovirus. You know, all of these that I'm mentioning here are in the herpes family. Cytomegalovirus is very similar to Epstein-Barr in terms of what it can do. Human herpes virus 6, which has been associated not only with chronic fatiguing illnesses, but also um, multiple sclerosis. And then herpes simplex, this is genital herpes and oral herpes. Uh, all of these are in the herpes family. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, we do test for these things, but they have to be careful interpreting the test because many of us have IgG positivity to these bugs because we've had prior exposures. It doesn't mean they're active. So, but if we see elevated antibodies in both the IgM and IgG class, that suggests that the infection is active. Or if we just see a very high level of IgG antibodies, even with normal IgM levels, we can be suspicious that there's been active, activation of an otherwise dormant infection. And then there's a handful of ways that we treat these things. There are some, some antivirals like Valtrex and Valcite. There are botanicals and there's nutraceuticals. I'm sorry, I'm not getting it to treatment. But, um, I, again, I recommend my book, but you know, if I was getting into treatment with each one of these things, we'd be here for the next three days. Okay, toxin issues. I particularly want to talk about mold toxins. Oh my God, what a big problem. So molds associated with indoor water damage, and we're talking particularly about um, penicillium and, um, and black mold, which is, I won't bother with the Latin names, that aspergillus, um, they, they all produce toxins. So we have two issues going on. One is the mold itself, and the other is the toxins they're producing, which are toxic. I mean, really toxic. These toxins impair immune function, endocrine function, neurological function. Again, all the regulatory systems, they cause many of the same problems as the Lyme and the other tick-borne infections. So they basically add to the problems. And it, it's, um, it's important to realize that um, am I going to get to this? I guess first we're going to talk about the toxins, so I, I, but I want to come back and talk about the sensitivity to mold. So I'm going to stick with toxins. I'm going to stick to the script. Okay. <clears throat> so what can happen is when you're exposed to these molds, you can inhale the mold spores. You can ingest the mold spores. Now there's colonization of the mold inside, endogenous mold or homogenous fungi, molded fungi are synonymous. And you can have a toxin producing machine inside you because you have mold growth inside you. This is not uncommon. And they are continuing to elaborate toxins long, long after the mold exposure. You could have been exposed when you were a kid, but guess what? If you inhaled or exposed these spores, now you have mold inside you that can continue to propagate mold toxins, which by the way, I think is what happened to me. So treatment includes binders, uh, 
toxin binders, systemic antifungals, things that'll kill that mold inside you, and sinus antifungals, because that is a, an area where fungi tends to colonize even without sinus infections, although it can also cause sinus infections. But what I wanted to talk about, or at least mention, is you know I, I, I mentioned previously that people with Lyme become more sensitive to molds. It's not just that they get a runny nose or, or, um, or an asthma attack, what we typically would identify as an allergic response. They can get real systemic reactions from migraine headaches, fatigue, brain fog, joint pains, exhaustion, um, just from the mold exposure. Sometimes people are living at home and they have no idea, but then they go visit their parents for two weeks and it's a nice mold-free environment. They can't believe how much better they feel. And they think it's because, you know, they're, uh, they're on vacation and then they come back to the house and wow, you know, suddenly they feel like they're, they're going downhill. You know that there's something going on in that, in that house. Okay, heavy metals. Well, it, you know, it amazes me uh, when people aren't getting better and particularly when they have, have, have neurotoxicity, usually in the form of brain fog that's not improving where we'd like it to be, they typically have some heavy metals. It's, not, it's really common. And I'm not talking about industrial exposures. I'm not talking about even having any idea where these exposures came from. But suffice it to say that both lead and mercury are in our air, water, and food. Um, mercury is particularly in dental fillings, the old type of silver mercury uh, amalgams. And um, and the way to, uh, well, I guess I put common sources right there. Uh, it's important to note that these toxins, again, like mycotoxins and like the infections, they impair immune, endocrine, and neurologic function. I sometimes see doctors t doing blood tests for these, and you're not going to come out with a positive blood test unless it's like a, a an acute industrial exposure. These heavy metals do not hang out in the bloodstream. They go into the tissues, particularly nervous tissues. And if you run a test for it appropriately, you give a chelating agent, which is a binder. It binds with the, with the heavy metal and then takes it out both the urine and the stool. When I do it, I just measure the urine. It's a whole lot easier than collecting stool. And we sometimes get really high levels but often moderately high levels. And when we treat it by giving those very same chelating agents, people say, whoa, you know, my brain fog went away. I'm just gonna mention, um, Dale Bredesen wrote a best-selling book called um, The End of Alzheimer's. And uh, he's a really good guy. I read his book. Uh, he's done original research on Alzheimer's disease in terms of, the, in the first half of the book, he describes the pathogenesis. You know, how does this happen? He describes amyloid formation as a result of different kinds of stresses that then can take a life of its own. He said that the drugs that treat amyloid formation, like the recently one approved against the advice of the advisory council for the FDA, um, that it's it's really, you know, like, 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 closing the barn doors after the, the, the cows, the horses, or whoever already got out. It's not going to work, and, and it doesn't. So um, what he says is the reason you start to see this amyloid buildup is because one or two or three of three issues, and they are uh, toxicity, inflammation, and imbalances in hormones and nutrients which is exactly what we're talking about. And I wrote to him and he is such a mention. He wrote a nice blurb from my book, which is on the top of the back cover, which made my agent very, very happy. So, but he's a good guy. And he talks about a lot of the same things I do. He knows a whole lot more than I will ever appreciate about Alzheimer's disease. But frankly, I know a whole lot more about these other issues, but we are talking about the same thing here inflammation, toxicity issues, and imbalances in hormones and nutrients. Okay, well, methylation. 
Wow, this is a big one. I'm just gonna, I think it's, there it is. There's methylation, folks. I think it's sort of beautiful, but it's also overwhelming. Um, I'm actually gonna be talking in particular about this guy, MTHFR. I'm not gonna tell you what the uh, colloquialism is for that, but, it, but what it does, that enzyme takes THF, which is effectively folate. Folate, which is part of the B complex, it's in foliage, uh, ergo its name, and converts it, where do, where do we go? There we go. It converts folate to its active form, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. So if this isn't working very well, then this gear isn't going to go around very efficiently. It's going to slow down. If you have two mutations here, it kills. this will slow down 70%. And you can see how this gear will not turn around very fast. And this gear will not turn around very fast. And But that's only one mutation. You can have mutations. Well, I lost it again. There we are. MTR, MTRR, BHMT. You can have mutations any of these places. Well, methylation is really important. And here's it does occur in virtually every cell of the body. And what does it do? Well, we know it mainly because it, it's important for detoxification. Remember, the normal process of metabolism results in metabolites that need to be biotransformed, metabolized, and then excreted. Okay, but it does a lot of other things. Methylation uh, processes neurotransmitters and sex hormones produces energy, it regulates glutathione, repairs DNA, turns genes on, oh, I mean, methylation is a big deal. Um, on every patient, I will do a DNA analysis for MTHFR. And in people who are really sick and really sensitive, I'll do uh, a bigger analysis that looks at other mutations and actually even measure those methylation intermediates. So homocysteine is easy to measure in routine labs, but we can measure methionine, SAMI, s homocysteine, and these different um, intermediates and try to figure out where and how we can improve the efficiency of methylation. Okay, I'm summing it up, folks. How do we treat Lyme disease complex? So it's really, really important that we appreciate the entire patient, the whole patient, the whole patient scenario. Um, there are so many different moving parts and we need to, to give space to, to let the patient describe what's going on on so many different levels. We as practitioners really need to be compassionate and understanding. And if we're not, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be in this field. Um, it helps that many of us actually have suffered from Lyme disease complex or have had family members. In the old days, you know, old days, you know, like 20 odd years ago, when we go to ILADS meetings and there are only maybe a hundred of us, virtually all of us, either we ourselves had it or family member had it. And then we found out that the mainstream docs, the, the infectious disease docs really had not a clue. And that's why we're getting together to share information. Safety. Well, if we want to have a good relationship with our patients, we need to offer a, a safe space for people to, to talk and to feel safe, that it, it's okay to say things that other doctors didn't want to hear. And, it, and it's important for us to be gentle. And I don't mean just gentle in the way we interact with the patient, but gentle in in our treatments. The chronically ill patients can be very sensitive. We have to be very, very careful. I tell my patients, we never start two things at once. And most things we're going to start at a low dose and build up. That's different than people with acute Lyme disease. Like, oh, guess what? Last month I was so in such and such a place I, and I got this bullseye rash. What do we do? I'm going to really treat that very aggressively. And the sooner it's treated, the better. But people have been sick for years. Wow, they can really be fragile. And we just have to appreciate wherever each patient is at. I'll mention that, you know, in, um, on a very frequent basis, someone says to me, how do you treat Lyme? And I say, 
you know, I don't treat Lyme disease. I treat people. They're all different. I cannot give you a cookbook. That's why my, my book, which is, is almost 400 pages long, it, you know, it, it's, it's just guidelines. But we have to spend a lot of time with our patients. You know, my, when patients come to see me, I usually spend probably an average two and a half to three hours with the initial intake and just wanting to get the whole picture. It's very important that we don't prescribe multiple antibiotics simultaneously. It can cause serious Herxheimer, which are die-off reactions. And these, this can be, they can be quite serious. Um, but even if they don't cause serious impairment, I can tell you they can cause serious symptoms. I mean, really can crash people. So we start things one at a time, like I said, and we start them slowly. And then consistency. And this has to do with the fact that, you know, my patients, most of them, they've been sick a long time. They've not had doctors listening and they've had lots of things going on. And I think it's really important that they know that I'm there for them and I do my best to respond to patients' issues in a timely manner. I think that's important if we take on the responsibility of treating this patient population. And finally, hope. You know, most of my patients get much better. Um, I, I would say that, that 80 to, no, I would say 90% of my patients get somewhere between 80 and 100% better. You know, and those are pretty good numbers. And I've heard other Lyme docs, you know, use similar numbers. There's still 10% of people who, you know, still are, you know, we're, we're still working with, and we are finding more answers. And we will continue to work with them seeking more answers. So that's it, folks. I'm open to hearing questions, and I appreciate your listening to this whole presentation. Thank you so much. That was so helpful. I will take the first question, and that is from Deanne. And her question is, what are your thoughts on rectal ozone therapy for treating Lyme and its co-infections? Okay, so I'm going to talk about oxidative treatments in general. Oxidative, which is not oxygen, by the way, it has to do with giving, giving oxidative agents, which in effect are free radicals. Well, I guess I could go in a long talk. I'll try to narrow it down. There's four oxidative treatments. There's hyperbaric oxygen, ozone, ultraviolet blood irradiation, and intravenous hydrogen peroxide, which is also oral hydrogen peroxide. And these agents have multiple functions. One is they can kill bugs. Another one is they actually, by giving, we're actually giving free radicals but thereby stimulating our own antioxidant system, which is important. So I do see benefits from giving ozone. Mm -hmm. I have seen the most benefits from giving it intravenously in combination with ultraviolet blood irradiation. And there are people in Denver, and I'm pretty sure in Boulder who do this. I'm not sure where else in the state. Um, but if you... Um, want to do this yourself, the way most people do it is rectal ozone. And this gets well absorbed. Remember that the intestines, you know, have something like the surface area of a tennis court. And so you're going to absorb a lot of ozone that way. And I know people who've, who've definitely benefited from it and be aware, like anything that's going to kill bugs, it can cause a Herxheimer reaction. So start slowly. Don't do it every day. Do it, you know, at most twice a week, probably. Okay, um, next question we have is from Lisa Kennedy. And um, she's asking, what food testing do you recommend with um, allergies and intolerances? What, what testing do you do? Yeah, so, you know, in a previous lifetime, I was an environmental medicine doctor. You know, I had a, I mean, I had what was called anywhere from a holistic practice to a complementary and alternative medicine practice to a functional medicine, you know, it's all the same thing, really. But I ended up doing a lot of environmental medicine. I was a member of, of the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, even lectured there. And at, at that time, I was in Massachusetts, and I think I saw the sickest people in northern New England with sensitivities. 
I've taken thousands of people through elimination challenge diets to try to figure out what they're sensitive to. Now, in the old days, I know I'm dating myself yet again, but we're talking about a, you know an easy generation to two generations ago. It was different than it is now. Basically, if people had food sensitivities, it was one or more of usually like six foods. And then if it didn't fit into that, there were another six foods. So it was like milk, corn, eggs, wheat, and then sugar, yeast, gluten. And then it was soy and, and pork and beef. You know, it, it, but you know, it was really a finite number of foods that people were sensitive to. It was very easy to put people on elimination diets. Okay, so just eat lamb and rice and veggies and you know, fish. I mean, it was easy. Not so easy anymore. People are, can be sensitive to avocado and rice and lamb. I mean, things we never saw one or two generations ago. There's a whole other lecture here about you know, what's happening to our population, right? Um, so, um, so I've had so much experience dealing with food sensitivities that sometimes I can just take a history and say, well, I think it's more likely than not that you're sensitive to A, B, or C, or A, B, and C. Um, in the article that I, I encourage people to look at in LymeDisease.org that I was just posted two weeks ago or so, I describe a kid who, uh, you know, he, he, first of all, he had lots of ear infections. So that, what does that mean? It means he got put on a lot of antibiotics and he's chronically congested and he, and he craves cheese and sugar. Okay. Well, if you haven't heard of the allergy addiction syndrome, you should look it up because it turns out that people often crave the foods that they're sensitive to. And there's sort of a stimulation withdrawal response. And if you try to imagine this, just think of caffeine. Or if you want, think of heroin. You know, it, the sooner it gets into your system, the more it's going to cause these big swings in stimulation withdrawal. But the point is, this kid craved cheese and sugar. And, um, and I said, gee, I think he's sensitive to dairy products causing his congestion. That's what caused his ear infections. And then he gets put on antibiotics. Then he gets on an overgrowth of yeast. And now he's become sensitized to the yeast, which means anything he eats with, with yeast in it or sugar, which stimulates the yeast inside him, are going to cause problems. We took him off of dairy, sugar, and yeast. And oh my God, he was a new kid. Just that. We haven't even treated his infections yet. And I had other, I had this, this young lovely woman she's probably like 13 at this point she starts she developed Sexuality. pans when she was about eight years old severe anxiety syndrome agoraphobia i mean afraid to leave her house if she has sugar yeast panic attacks okay but i'm not answering the question what what do we how do we measure this you know again you, you know just on the basis of her cravings and that little boy's cravings you know i can say just go off these foods and see how it goes and by the way, I often say, guess what? The whole family has to go off these foods. You can't be eating these foods in front of this child, you know, and expect him to stay off these foods. And you got to get him out of the house. You cannot bring these foods into the house. It, it just doesn't work and it's not fair. And by the way, the whole family typically benefits when you do that. Um, but you got to convince them. And, and um, usually the fathers are the hardest to convince. That's an aside. <laughs> Um, okay, but but sometimes, you know, it's it seems more complicated. I'm really not sure. And I'll send off blood tests. There's a bunch of labs that do this. I've been using mainly Meridian Valley, which is up in the state of Washington. Um, none of these lab tests are 100%. They all have some false positives and or false negatives. Um, and then, but sometimes something sticks out that you weren't suspicious of, like soy turns out to be a big problem for quite a few people out there and, and so on. So, you know, like, like I said, usually I'll start off just shooting from the hip on the basis of the history, but then I'll, I'll um, you know, I will do blood tests in people if, if we're not finding an obvious answer. I'll just mention that I often, well, I always, when I'm taking the initial history, I'll ask people, 
Well, when you were a child, did you have problems with chronic congestion, frequent colds, frequent sore throats, frequent ear infections, lots of just stuffy, runny noses? Did you have asthma? Did you have lots of belly aches, diarrhea, constipation, headaches? These are all issues with food sensitivities. A kid with constipation, almost always food sensitivities. You know, I could go on and on about it, but it's a big issue in the patient population of Lyme disease complex. Our next question is from Gary Desmond and his question is, he just wants to know if you're accepting new patients in Denver. Well, in, in theory, I am in practice, not very many, you know, I get, many requests on a daily basis and um, and I and I do occasionally will have a hole in the schedule when someone or a few people we can move around and then we'll fit in a new patient but it amounts to probably an average of two a month and given the size of the waiting list many people are never going to get in I do we always you know, recommend other people if they don't want to be on the waiting list. Um, and I feel really sad about that. But, you know, sadly, that's where we're at. Um, let's see. I, I can't tell who this question is from, but um, the question is thoughts on oral versus IV versus IM treatments for a chronic Lyme patient. Um, what are your thoughts on each of those? Ones? Well, there's no 100% guidelines there. There are certain conditions in which we'll tend to go to intravenous, and that's when people are not responding to oral antibiotics, if their guts cannot handle oral antibiotics, if they have more aggressive infections, um, and uh, if and you know then we have issues that can limit like like insurance not covering it. Uh, not having the, the physical and emotional, uh, as well as the financial support to deal with it. Uh, in the book, I, I sort of point out, here's when we should consider these, these options and, and here's you know, the limitations. Uh, so I, I don't have any easy, quick answer to that. It's really a clinical judgment. The next question is from the handle is Jay Roadman, so not sure their full name, but that is, uh, thank you for your time. Can you talk about how you are managing COVID in your practice for patients with Lyme complex? I'm specifically interested in your opinion, opinions on the vaccines and the chances of significant flares in symptoms. Also, in your thoughts on ivermectin, mechicin, did I say that right? See, I told you I can't say this. Told you. <laughs> I'd like to blame it on Lyme, but I don't think that's why. Anyway, go ahead, doctor. <laughs> okay, well, COVID, wow, what a terrible, terrible issue we have. Um, so, I, you know, this is, I mean, this is a, a really big question. I'm going to narrow it down a bit. Um, I'm going to talk about the vaccines first. I hope 98% of us get vaccines and I'm, they're not without problems, they, they, but the virus is worse. The virus is worse than the vaccines in terms of causing problems. <laughs> that said, um, it, this is not a, it, it's not straightforward. I said 98%, not a hundred percent. Um, there are people who can who have bad reactions to the vaccine, and um, and you know some of the, some people with some of my patients with Lyme disease have crashed from the vaccine. I've seen a lot of people with flares of certain, inf you know, like Bartonella. It actually happened to me, um, a flare of Bartonella infection after getting the vaccine. I think it's not unlikely that we're going to see autoimmune problems in the future related to the vaccine. Although, don't expect any of the, um, the either the CDC or any medical organizations to admit to any of what I'm saying. Um, that said, I still think most of us should get vaccinated because that's how we're going to stop this thing. And um, and I've had very fragile patients get vaccinated and not have any problems. 
it really surprised me. And I mean, if they'd asked me, I'd say, wow, I think maybe you're one of those people who shouldn't get vaccinated, but they'd already been vaccinated. And guess what I did, I'm fine. I mean, I have no way of predicting who's gonna have a problem with the vaccine and who doesn't. I'd say if you have had severe vaccine reactions in the past, you know that. You know, like I had a patient who last fall had the flu vaccine and she was down with migraines for a couple of weeks. I said, wow, I don't think you should get the COVID vaccine. Um, so uh, that's sort of the, the, the state. Uh, I do think that we, are, should, we still need to wear masks indoors. I, you know, those of us who've been dealing with Lyme uh, uh, know that the CDC is not a perfect organization. They've gotten so many things wrong with Lyme disease that we weren't surprised they got so many things wrong with COVID. Although I admit, I'm surprised at how many things they've gotten wrong with COVID. Um, and the last one that they got wrong, well, some people are saying the last thing they got wrong was the, with their guidelines about opening schools. But before that, they were saying, okay, people who are vaccinated don't wear, have to wear masks anymore. Meanwhile, of course, the people who are not vaccinated or refusing vaccines, they weren't ma wearing masks to begin with. You know, and it's like, really? It, it, it just makes no sense. It's like hard to believe that these are intelligent academic people making these decisions. And sorry to say that maybe. Um, COVID is, you know, is, is a real threat. And obviously people are dying from it. And then there's up to 30% of people who develop long COVID or, or post COVID syndrome or long hauler syndrome, which looks just like Lyme disease. And those of us who are dealing with Lyme disease, yeah, we know what this is. This is a hyperinflammatory response to some antigen. The antigen is something that can provoke an inflammatory response. And whether the virus is still there, or you're just dealing with the spike protein, which by itself, the spike protein has shown to cause a lot of internal problems, just that. And remember, the vaccine is, is basically telling our cells how to make the spike protein. So therein lies potential problems with the vaccine. Again, you know, I think the vaccine is a whole lot better than getting COVID. Uh, I think the virus has potentially a lot worse complications than the vaccine. Um, there's something I was going to say about that, and I can't remember what it was, but let's talk about ivermectin. Uh, ivermectin is an antiparasitic drug. It was uh, put on the market about 50 years ago by Merck. It's an amazing drug. This drug cleared it treated elephantiasis and river blindness, affected millions of Africans, and it cleared them. I mean, millions of people. Um, and it's been used people of all ages. It's ridiculously safe, um, has a very short list of potential side effects, has hardly any drug interactions. With, the only one I'm aware of is Coumadin or Warfarin. Those are, that's a blood th thinner. Um, anyone who has horses knows all about ivermectin. It's used to treat parasitic infections in horses all the time. Um, it's given to kids for with scabies and different worms and this and that. I mean, this is, it's, it's been around forever. The, the people who, who developed it, they won a Nobel Prize in 2015. I mean, amazing medication. Well, Ivermectin, as well as a long list of other agents, have been tested against different viruses. And it was shown in the laboratory to have effectiveness against SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID. A lot of drugs have, and that doesn't mean they're effective in people, right? There are drugs that are effective against Borrelia burgdorferi in the lab, but they don't work in people. And But this one, for some reason, some investigators decided to try it out. Well, there's almost 60, almost 60 articles. Almost all of them have been shown, have shown that it works. And it works in different stages from mild COVID to severe COVID. And I just remembered, you know, um, what I was going to mention. So if you don't mind this little digression, you know, one thing that our government tried to do while, in, while our past president was there getting 
recommendations from a radiologist at Stanford, crazy stuff, right? Was that we should be seeking herd immunity. If 30% of people who develop mild illness develop long COVID syndrome, just think of the amount of illness we're talking about. And I mean, it's crazy, crazy stuff they're talking about. Okay, I'm getting off that pedestal. I'll move on to another one. So ivermectin, it's been effective in relatively small studies, but guess what? Studies that are just as big as using corticosteroids for people with COVID pneumonia. I mean, that has one study that shows it's effective and now it's part of the treatment plan. Ivermectin has almost 60 studies. Again, all stages of illness, including prophylaxis. Now, I've been hesitant to go public and talk about this much because I'm already public and talking about Lyme disease all the time. And now they're gonna say, oh, well, look, Kindle Air, he's one of these people who believes in fringe treatments for COVID like ivermectin. But the truth is I do, just don't spread it around because I'm doing my best to deal with Lyme disease, okay? But I prescribe ivermectin all the time. My family just came over from Israel on an 18 hour flight, right? I had them all, go and my kids are vaccinated, but not my grandkids who are too young. Well, I had them all go on ivermectin two, two days before the flight. And I'm, I think that the Delta variant, think about this. The Delta variant's considered much more communicable than the UK variant, which is much more communicable than the original strains, which were already ridiculously contagious. I mean, and, I, and Dr. Walensky, the head of the CDC, she said, this is the most contagious virus that I've ever witnessed in, in, her, in her lifetime. Um, it, that, that's crazy. And it's now, I think, 80% predominant here in the United States. And as long as people aren't getting vaccinated, we're, you know, we're just going to continue to have these things, including in states Thank God in Colorado, I'm pretty sure <clears throat> you folks might know better than I, but I'm pretty sure we're over 70% vaccinated, which I'm very grateful for. I'm still putting mask on when I go indoors. And I suggest you folks do too, including an N95 mask. I mean, this Delta variant, it's ridiculously contagious. And guess what? I take ivermectin once a week with food. I'm finding pharmacies telling people to take it on an empty stomach. I don't know why they're saying that. Take it with food. It'll be much better absorbed and effective. And um, interestingly, so I have a friend who's taking, who I prescribed this for. She's not my patient, but I know she has tick-borne infections and she has significant viral infections. And she said, you know, I had a Herx when I started taking it. And then I started getting better. She has chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, chronic fatigue syndrome is getting better on ivermectin. And I'm wondering, you know, what are the viruses we should be treating? Because on paper, guess what? It's effective against Epstein-Barr and some other viruses. So, you know, one, one more agent that turns out to be ridiculously safe in our armamentarium to consider. On paper, it also works against Babesia, although I don't think it does much against Babesia because I'll herx like crazy if I take anything for a Babesia and it does nothing for me. Um, other than make me feel safer about this COVID. Um, so there's my spiel about COVID. Thank you. Um, and on that note, I'll go to Claire Delia's question. Um, and she's asking, have you been using tefenoquin, um, hmm. Aricota or Crintifel to treat Babesia? I've been on disulfiram for one and a half years and it did not get rid of my B Babesia. Wow, that's a really, really good question. Um, so uh, I and other Lyme practitioners around the country are finding cases of Babesia that are resistant to what we've been using. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be surprised because we know Babesia is a malaria-like organism and what happens with malaria, we keep on finding whatever we're using that people become resistant to it. I remind people that artemisinin was was actually developed specifically for chloroquine resistant malaria. No surprise, now there's malaria that's resistant to artemisinin. Mm -hmm. So um, I have not used tofenoquine, although um, 
I probably will start using it in a couple patients who are not responding to the usual interventions for BCI. I understand it does have a bunch of side effects. There is going to be a presentation by a doctor in Maine uh, about his experience with tofenaquin. This is at ILADS, which is in October. Um, and I'm interested, probably, I, I'm, I might end up giving him a call even before then, um, because, uh, you know, despite what what it looks like and what I do. I really don't like to be ahead of the curve in terms of trying new treatments. I, you know, I'd rather people experiment on their own patients and I know something safe, well tolerated and, and does more good than harm before I use it. I'd rather not experiment on my patients. Um, and so far there's been very little experience with any of these alternatives um, as the, the clear suggested disulfiram turns out to be a really good drug against Babesia. On the other hand, when you have more than Lyme and Babesia, I like Bartonella, Mycoplasma, and so on, the disulfiram doesn't work nearly as well, including against Babesia. Um, I have used Crintafil, and um, again, not that much. It's been very hard to get. Pharmacies have been having a hard time filling these prescriptions, and I don't know what that's about. But I have had some success with Crintafel in people who've already been treated for Babesia but still have stuff. I've had some people do well on Crintafel. The third one that Claire mentioned, I, I didn't catch, but that Eric. means I also don't have experience with it. Okay, Aracoda? So they're all the same, uh, Crintafel and Aracoda. Oh, just different names. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, a colleague of mine here in Denver. Uh, Dr. Sean Naylor thinks that Crintafel is one of the best drugs he's used against Babesia. Again, he doesn't use it as a first-line drug. He uses it after he's already treated with the usual suspects. Thank you. Hey, this question is from Cheryl Baldwin. Is there a specific treatment for balance? Balance. Interesting question. The first thing I would wonder is, does she have pernicious anemia? You know, if this is someone who cannot do tandem gait, tandem gait is when you're walking heel to toe and, you know, you're, you can't do it. You're just, you know, falling. Um, and this has to do with lack of proprioception. Proprioception is the, um, is the information we get from the soles of our feet that tell us where we are in space and that keeps us upright. For example, if you put your feet together, so you know you're, they're touching and you're standing and you close your eyes so you no longer have the visual to see where you are in space, then, and you start to fall over, that's called a positive Romberg sign on a, um, on a neurological exam. That's a lack of proprioception, has an awful lot to do with balance. And, and like I said, the first thing I would think of is, does this person not have adequate B12? Uh, and I would definitely check B12 levels. And I would mention in that context that anything less than 500 is suspicious, even though the laboratory will say that the cutoff is something like 250. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a workup for pernicious anemia if it's low. And that's assuming you're not, if you're a vegan, you will have pernicious anemia unless you're supplementing with B12. But then there are people who don't have the apparatus to absorb B12. Okay, so, so we are talking about some sort of neuropathic issue uh, of which low, low levels of B12 is something reversible. But it could be that the issue has to do with infections that are affecting the nerves. And we know that Babesia and Bartonella are the two that do that the worst. And, and those have to be investigated and treated. And then when people say they have balance problems, I wanna make sure that they don't mean that they're lightheaded. You know, they stand up and they feel woozy. Is that what they mean by balance problem? So we really wanna be clear. We wanna be clear what they're talking about. Um, and then, you know, basically, uh, target the treatment depending on where we think the source of the problem is. Okay, and then we have a question from Jenny Gold. Um, have you seen 
will crash. Um, I, I'm guessing this is in hyperbolic chamber or after hyperbolic chamber. Okay, I, I, I assume we, she means hyperbaric chamber? It's hyperbolic, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Jenny, if, if you wanna unmute and clarify on your question there. Actually, I meant, I meant what Dr. Kindler just said. Okay, so great. not crash in the machine, but afterwards. Because what's yeah. happened to me, I was going one to two times a week and I crashed bad for like three months. So that's well, my question. Thank okay. you. Uh, hi, Jenny. Um, so. Hi. I have hi seen, yeah, I've seen. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long while. I have seen people have significant Herxheimer reactions. And you know, if it's a bad enough Herxheimer reaction, you can stay crashed for a long time. You know, this is where I have, I, I mean, I've seen patients go to other doctors who say, well, we're gonna treat you on antibi intravenous antibiotics and start three things at once. And I'm like, oh my God, you're kidding me. Here's a person who's, in a wheelchair because of you know severe neuropathy and pain syndromes, and you're going to put them on three intravenous antibiotics at once. I mean, you could crash a person for a long, long time doing it. Hyperbaric oxygen it can cause significant Herxheimer reactions, and my guess is that the overwhelming inflammation associated with that Herxheimer reaction is what crashed you. But the problem is that it doesn't necessarily go away in a few days or even a couple of weeks because you know what what can happen with these severe Herxheimer reactions is I, I describe it as pissing off the bugs you know like you go after them hard and now the bugs just flare in response and then people don't tolerate what they used to tolerate that's why I keep on telling people to slow down to do everything gently that the tortoise beats the hare and they try to push the dose despite the fact that they're hurting and something like that, um, it, they not only get inflamed, but then they don't tolerate what they used to tolerate. They become much harder to treat. So, um, you know, sadly, Jenny, I think that that's more likely than not what happened to you and that you're going to have to focus on anti-inflammatory agents uh, like CBD and buswellia and curcumin and Anything you can do, you know, look at whether foods are triggering you more now than they used to, and are you in a mold-free environment? Things because you might be more sensitive than you were before the uh, hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Okay. Next question is from um, I just lost it. It's from Chris. There we go, Chris Mason. Do you use binders for molds? Do you use the same binders, excuse me, for molds and metals? Uh, the answer is no. I don't use the same binders for molds and metal. For metals, we use chelating agents, which bind with the metals fairly selectively and then take them out the, through the kidneys, through the urine, and through the gut and the stool. And if we try to, if we mobilize these too quickly, people will react. They'll get particularly brain fog, you know, some neurological problems if we mobilize the metals too quickly. Um, most people are fine, but some people are not. We have to be very, very gentle. Uh, for molds, we're using binders that are mainly in the gut, like cholestyramine, charcoal, bentonite clay, and so on. They're not absorbed. And the obvious question, well, if they're not absorbed, how, you know, what are they binding? We were talking about, about toxins in the nervous system. But these toxins have what is known as an enterohepatic circulation. That is, they're cleared in the liver into the intestines and then reabsorbed. And by the way, some of our hormones like estrogen do that as well. And then if we bind them in the gut, it prevents the reabsorption and that's how they work. But I'm just gonna repeat something that I mentioned in the lecture, which is that if you have, um, if you have endogenous fungal colonization generating mold toxins, you also have to take a systemic antifungal and kill that. And I'll just share what happened to me. You know, I became Medicare age. I decided to get a mold toxin test because it was for free in real-time labs. It came out really high. I had no idea. I 
never consciously lived in a moldy environment. I'm guessing it was childhood only because it was a really old house. And, um, and so, okay, I had these whole high mold toxin levels. I started on toxin binders and antifungal nasal spray and I'm doing saunas. And after four months, I repeat the test. It had not changed. I still had these high levels. And, and so, and I put myself on itraconazole, which is a systemic antifungal. I should mention fluconazole, which we use for yeast, is, is an antifungal, but it doesn't hit this broader spectrum of fungi that create the mold toxins. It only hits the yeast subset of fungi. So I put myself on itraconazole. Four months later, my levels of mycotoxins were 50% better. Another four months, another 50% better. It's really important to kill that endogenous colonization. And something I actually forgot to mention, you know, I mentioned how people can react to mold, uh, the, you know, with systemic reactions, you know, allergic to mold spores. But just imagine if you're allergic to mold and you have it inside you, you're dealing with a, another issue that's generating chronic inflammation and just making you feel like crap. So um, systemic antifungals can be an important part of the whole therapeutic regimen. Okay. Um, Thank Jeanette you. Alona, let's see. She would like to know how uh, to get ivermectin. Ah, you know, <laughs> um, this is so sad that mm, the vast majority of doctors are refusing to, to prescribe it. It's still, this still bewilders me. You know, here you have a ridiculously safe drug that um, is also inexpensive. And doctors call it fringe medicine. If you get it, if you get admitted to the hospital with COVID, that's severe enough to admit you to the hospital, which means you probably have pneumonia. They'll give you remdesivir at $3,000 a shot, not been shown to really work. And, um, and with a host of side effects. And they'll give you a high dose of corticosteroids, which does help, but also with lots of side effects, but they won't give you ivermectin. And um, how the, I, I don't understand who can control the media to, to stop information about ivermectin from getting through. I know that no one's gonna make money on ivermectin. Even Merck who makes ivermectin or originally made it has come out against it, why? Sounds crazy? No, I'll tell you why, because they wanna come up with some expensive drugs like remdesivir that they can make money on. They can't, no one's gonna make money on ivermectin. Okay, again, I'll, I'll get off that. <laughs> I'll get off that one. Um, you know, if you have a friend who has horses, you know, you might be able to get it that way from a friendly veterinarian. If, but you know, you can ask your doctor. Just sadly, most aren't. Most are going to refuse to prescribe it. This one is from Lisa Kennedy. What would cause someone not to absorb B twelve and high and have high levels in the blood? So. I'm a little confused by the question. If you can't absorb it, how would you get high levels in the blood? Lisa, um, if you're there, if you want to come off mute and clarify that question. If that's I a really great question. My, um, my doctor had me taking B12 and I would have B12 symptoms, like lacking B12 symptoms, but the levels were very high in the blood. Um, so it wasn't making sense. Yeah. So when you were taking B12, how were you taking it? Um, injection. Oh, well, if you take it by injection, you're going to be absorbing it. The, you know, the, so let me explain the normal absorption process of B12. It has the most complicated ab absorption process of any vitamin. Um, what happens is when it enters the stomach, it has to, there's a, uh, a protein called intrinsic factor that's secreted by parietal cells and the lining of the stomach. They bind with the B12 and it goes down to the lower part of the small intestine, the ileum, that's where it's absorbed. So 
if you don't have an ileum because you've had surgery or you have Crohn's disease, or if your stomach lining doesn't make intrinsic factor, then you won't be able to absorb vitamin B12. That's if you're taking it orally. If you take it by injection, it's absorbed. Now, um, understand that parietal cells, by the way, in addition to making intrinsic factor, make hydrochloric acid. People who aren't making intrinsic factor and can't absorb B12, they all have hypochlorhydria, that is, or achlorhydria, no stomach acid, which as I talked about, has its own set of complications. So my question, Lisa, my question is, how was the, you know, what were your B12 levels before you were on the injections of B12? It's a good question. Initially they were low, then I took it orally, then the blood levels came back high. Then we tried the injection. I probably need to get retested. Okay, your levels are gonna be high. I mean, once you're in injections, your levels are gonna be high. But if you took oral and they went up, then it suggests you just weren't getting B12 in your diet. Now the sources of B12 in the diet are typically meat, eggs, and dairy. Were you a vegan? No. So I don't know why you were missing B12 in the diet. Is the B12 you were taking orally, was it just B12 or was it B12 complexed with intrinsic factor? Just B12. So, and how low was your B12 on the, on the um, test? Do you know what the number was? I don't remember. That's such a good question, but I know it was exceedingly high to the fact where my regular doctor was like, that's flagged. We got to get you checked elsewhere. So. Exceedingly high, you said, but I'm talking about low. Right. I don't remember. It was low initially. Okay. Understand that if you get an injection, your level's going to be high, okay. which is not a problem. You cannot OD on B12. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So not to worry about that. I don't have a full explanation of what's like, if you were not on a vegan diet, why you would have a low B12, unless it was a lab error which guess what happens more than we'd like to think. So I'm, I'm a little unclear, I am curious how low we're talking about. Um, and I'm glad a doctor picked it up because I've seen doctors at universities be clueless of what pernicious anemia is. So, um, uh, but here's the thing, the neuropathic symptoms of low B12 can, up, can be caused by a lot of other things, including tick-borne infections and particularly Bartonella and Babesia can cause a lot of neuropathic symptoms. It, it, you know, the symptoms of pernicious anemia often start with balance issues and, 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 or, and some neuropathy, but then can go on, it, it can cause dementia. I mean, it's one of the reversible causes of dementia. So it can cause also it's a brain fog issues and, and the anemia, even though it's called pernicious anemia, the anemia is a really late stage of B12 deficiency, even though we call it pernicious anemia as soon as you can't absorb B12. So I, I'm not sure what's going on with you. Uh, you can get B12 intrinsic factor complex, which allows you to absorb B12 without get, taking the injections. But the injections, by the way, even in people who don't have pernicious anemia can actually help heal nerves, particularly methylcobalamin. Mm -hmm. So um, I sometimes use really, really high doses of methylcobalamin in patients. And sometimes it can help heal the neuropathy. It often helps with neuropathic pain um, and it can help with cognition and energy and mood as well. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Lisa. Um, thank you. Um, we we are at time, and uh, Dr. Kendler, I, I didn't know if you needed to do a hard stop or if you have time for one or two more questions. Sure, I can do one or two. One or two. Okay. So the the next question then is, what is your best Herx treatment? Yeah, you know, there's no one best of anything. It's always a combination <laughs> of it's always a combination things, you know. So the things that I use, I love Alka-Seltzer Gold. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just have a lot of people say, whoa, I feel much better. <laughs> Take this stuff, which is just alkaline salts, which you can also get in tri-salts, which is made by a couple different companies. Um, 
you know, I'll use all the anti-inflammatories, whether it's curcumin and boswellia, CBD can be really helpful giving um, the toxin binders that we talked about, like charcoal and bentonite. Th these, these also bind cytokines, which are the inflammatory messengers and can really help. Um, and then there's, there's hot or warm baths with um, six cups each of Epsom salts and baking soda. Uh, some people, I know people sometimes do this twice a day when they have severe Herxheimer reactions. So I really can't answer one best thing. Who I can tell you that one best thing for person A is not going to be the best thing for person B. Thank you. All right, we have three more questions. So I'm just going to take it in order. And I apologize to the other two individuals that we did not have time to get to yours. Uh, this one is from Claire again. And her question is, who is the doctor in Maine who will be presenting at ILADS this year on that word I can't say, Krentafel and Babesia? You got okay, it. He's going to be oh, I said it. Yay. Yeah, he's yeah. actually presenting on Tefenequin, uh, not Krentafel. Uh, I don't know if anyone's presenting on Krintafel. It's just a colleague of mine, Steve Bach, who's, who's uh, the vice president of ILAD, he's gonna be president. Uh, he told me about the doctor, main. I don't even know the doctor's name. He just said, oh yeah, we're gonna have a presentation by this main doctor. And, and if I did, I'll just have to call Steve back and ask him who it is, you know, if I wanna get in contact with him before then. Sorry, I don't have that information. Thank you very much for your time. Um, for those that are here um, on the phone with us or on the Zoom with us, this will is, has been recorded. I will get this posted on both Meetup with Dr. K's presentation slide deck, and it will also be posted on our uh, Facebook group as well. Yeah. And so, I just want to say um, thank you, Dr. Kinderler. You've been a yes. consistent support for our group and, and to so many patients in Colorado and beyond, and we really appreciate your your willingness and openness to, to support us this way. So thank you. You yeah. are very welcome. And thank for you for all the work you do. Only because I really enjoyed, and I think a lot of people will get benefit is um, if you haven't yet read Dr. Kendallair's book, it is, it's worth having. It's a great synopsis and, and extension of everything that you shared today. So it's, it's a great resource. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. K. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Dr. K. You're welcome.